Geographers, I hope you're ready because today on the Mr. Sin channel, we're going to be reviewing the different changes that have occurred due to globalization and the world economy. Countries around the world have started to see economic restructuring occur as businesses seek to take advantage of the new global market. Today, we can see many businesses in core countries move production out of core countries and into semi-periphery and periphery countries. Core countries continue to lose jobs that are part of the secondary sector and have started to lose jobs that are in the tertiary sector as well. This is mainly because companies are looking to utilize cheaper labor markets and geographic areas with less regulation. This process of relocating a business's services or processes to a foreign country is known as offshoring. Companies who offshore their production are looking to take advantage of lower labor costs, tax incentives, and other favorable economic conditions that exist in a foreign country. Now another concept you might hear when looking at changes in production is outsourcing, which is similar to offshoring. Outsourcing is when a business contracts out a service or job to an external provider in order to reduce their costs and increase their efficiency. Essentially, it is when a company hires another company to do a job or provide a service for them instead of doing it themselves. In addition to outsourcing and offshoring, some companies will also adjust their production based on their size and the economies of scale that they can achieve. We last talked about this concept in our agriculture unit, where we looked at the spatial organization of agriculture. Companies that are able to achieve economies of scale see a decrease in their cost per unit of production. As companies get larger, they can purchase better machines, systems, and have more access to capital, which allows them to scale up faster, producing more of a product at a cheaper rate. Large agro-businesses have achieved economies of scale due to advanced machinery that can quickly produce lots of food, which lowers the average cost of each unit produced. Making it difficult for family farms to compete in the market with the larger corporate farm. We can also look at the Walt Disney Company as another company who has achieved economies of scale. Disney owns a variety of different companies that all share their ideas, talents, and resources with one another in order to produce high value content at a lower individual cost. It also has the resources to produce multiple films back to back, such as the case with Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, which helps save costs by reusing sets, costumes, and props, all of which helps Disney reduce their individual costs and increase their overall profit. Now, since we're on the topic of production and minimizing costs, we also have to talk about the international division of labor, which is a concept that seeks to illustrate how different countries utilize their comparative advantage to specialize in different economic activities, resources, and highlight the country's capabilities. Today, we can see that this global network of trade and production has both positives and negative aspects to it. When countries use the international division of labor and focus on their comparative advantage, it allows them to become more efficient at producing specific goods and to trade with other countries to obtain the other goods and services that they are not efficient at producing. All of which sounds great, but we can also see that there can be some real consequences to this new global market. For example, we can see the negative impact of economic restructuring when looking at the city of Detroit. Detroit used to be a thriving industrial city that was known for being one of the world's top auto manufacturing cities in the world. However, as companies sought to reduce the cost of production, they started to move out of the United States and into less economically developed countries, causing Detroit to experience deindustrialization as economic restructuring devastated the city's economy. The loss of the auto industry resulted in the loss of the city's main economic driver. As jobs left the city, so did many of the people, all of which increased the amount of vacant buildings on the market. Over time, we started to see increased rates of urban blight as homes and buildings were stripped of all value, vandalized, and left for decay. Now, as countries continue to participate more and more in the global economy, they will continue to see economic restructuring occur. Core countries will continue to see more of their secondary sector relocate out of the country and into the developing world. As their economy shifts away from manufacturing and continues to transition into more of a service-based economy, with the majority of of the jobs being located in the tertiary sector. Today, we can see semi-periphery and periphery countries seeking to increase economic investment from multinational corporations and core countries by creating special economic zones, free trade zones, and export processing zones, all of which lead to more globalization and economic restructuring, both for core countries and semi-periphery and periphery countries. Special economic zones are areas that seek to provide different incentives and benefits to businesses who 
operate in the area. This could include tax breaks, less regulations, or access to different services and infrastructure. The goal here is to attract foreign investment from multinational corporations and core countries to help promote economic development in the area. Companies that locate in special economic zones are given preferential treatment and do not have to follow the same laws and regulations as the rest of the country. Now, both free trade zones and export processing zones are a form of a special economic zone. However, they each focus on a specific goal. Free trade zones are areas within a country that also seek to promote global trade. These areas allow for companies to import and export different products without having to pay tariffs or custom duties. These zones are often centered around a port or infrastructure that allows for the movement of goods in and out of an area. Lastly, export processing zones are areas that have the goal of prioritizing the exportation of different goods out of the area. These have the primary focus on manufacturing goods in the area and then exporting those goods to a different country. An example of an export processing zone would be Maquiladora, which are manufacturing plants that are located in Mexico along the United States-Mexico border. This export processing zone was created by the Mexican government with the hopes of attracting foreign investment from the United States to produce products in Mexico. This increased local jobs in the area and also the amount of exports from Mexico to the United States. Companies that produce products in a maquiladora are able to utilize the cheaper labor force in Mexico, which allows companies to reduce their overall costs of production. All of these policies reshape the global international market of labor as they allow for countries to take advantage of their comparative advantage, specialize more, and trade more easily with countries around the world. Before we delve deeper into the production of different products, I want to also talk about the multiplier effect. The multiplier effect looks at how an original investment into an economy can create a ripple effect and end up creating a larger impact than the original amount spent. Essentially, when a person, organization, or government spends money, it creates a chain reaction of additional spending. Think of it this way. Let's say Apple decided to offshore some of their call centers and they open a new call center up in India. This center will have to be built, so Apple will have to pay for a construction company to build the facility and pay for all the different resources needed for the building. Apple will then have to staff the building where they will pay people every day to answer calls and provide support for the company. In this example, the original investment made by Apple is the building of the call center and the workers they are paying to run the center. But where the multiplier effect occurs is after the original investment. All of these workers that have been paid by Apple now have more money to either save or more money to purchase other products and items. If the workers from the call center go and spend the money they earn from Apple, they end up supporting other businesses, which increases the amount of economic activity and employment in the area. As those other businesses get more revenue, it allows them to hire more workers, produce more products, and support the economy. The people who work at these other businesses then have more access to money and will most likely go out and spend it, which ends up supporting other businesses and people. So we can see how this original investment from Apple created a chain reaction of additional spending, which ends up increasing the economic activity in the area. Now today, it is not just globalization that is changing how and where companies produce their products. We can also see how the contemporary economic landscape is changing as countries continue to shift from Fordist methods of production to post-Fordist methods of production. Fordism emphasizes mass production of standard goods in a large factory that uses assembly lines for production. This production method has a set division of labor, with each worker performing specific tasks. Decisions and production under Fordism are centralized, with a greater focus being put on standardization. Post-Fordism, on the other hand, emphasizes more flexible production methods, which are able to adjust to the daily changes of the market. This production method also has workers be trained in multiple tasks and roles to allow for a more adaptable workforce. There's often less of a focus on standard goods and more of a focus on custom goods that meet the specific customer needs and wants. Post-Fordism also tends to use local decisions when it comes to production, with production often being decentralized, meaning that production here no longer happens all in one location. Instead, goods are often produced in a variety of stages and locations. One way this is done is by utilizing a concept known as just-in-time delivery. This is when materials, parts, or products are delivered to a manufacturing facility precisely when they are needed. This helps reduce costs and waste by only having products arrive at the production facility when they are needed and only sending the exact parts that are actually going to be used for production. Just-in-time delivery helps reduce the cost of carrying inventory and increases the productivity, but it also has some big risks associated with it. Any delays in the supply chains or disruptions can delay the entire 
entire production process. Also, just-in-time delivery requires a high degree of coordination between the different suppliers and manufacturers. If there's any miscommunication between the two, it could stall production and result in a loss of revenue. Now, as time goes on, we continue to see less companies and countries utilize Fordism when it comes to production, and more companies start to take advantage of post-Fordist methods. All of this is due to the changing market demands, technological innovations, and increased globalization. Now, since we're talking about how production is now occurring in multiple stages and locations, we also need to look at the economic benefits of agglomeration and growth poles. Agglomeration is the clustering of different economic activities and industries in a specific geographic area. This happens because businesses want to reduce their overall cost by taking advantage of a larger labor force, benefiting from existing infrastructure in an area, or by utilizing different services and knowledge bases in an area. For example, we can see that many distribution centers will locate near major interstates, airports, rail yards, and ports. This allows them to use the pre-existing infrastructure in the area instead of building it for themselves, which reduces the overall cost of their production. Traditionally, agglomeration occurs naturally since it's in the company's best interest to locate in the area in order to help decrease their overall costs and increase their profits. Growth poles, on the other hand, are areas or cities that are centers of economic growth. They're often created by either targeted public or private investment. We can see that targeted investment can be done in a variety of different ways, such as by creating specific infrastructure that meets the needs of the businesses in the area. For example, creating more transportation routes or energy for companies in the city. We could also see governments create specific policies and investments in an area which create a pro-business environment for economic growth. For example, Silicon Valley in California has become a growth pole for technology and innovation. Here, different technology industries have flourished, which has created a pro-tech environment, which in turn has led to more tech-focused companies to cluster in the area in order to get the benefits from the talent and infrastructure that already exists in the area. Another example of a growth pole would be Dubai, which has experienced rapid growth and development thanks to investment from the government. Today, the city has become an international hub for business and tourism, with many multinational corporations located in the area. As time goes on, we'll continue to see more international trade and cooperation, which will only further increase the interconnectedness of states and economies around the world. Global supply chains and an ever-changing international division of labor will continue to lead to deindustrialization in core countries. As countries continue to move production to lower-cost countries, all of which leads to people to wonder just how sustainable is this new globalized world, and will we be able to continue to sustain our current production practices? But that is a question that we'll answer in our next video. Now comes the time to practice what we've learned. As always, if you found value in the video, consider subscribing. And if you need more help with your AP Human Geography class, don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet. The packet has exclusive videos and resources that can help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time online.